You're listening to The Lindia Grant Show. Think on these things with Lindia Grant. Listeners, it's good to be here with you this afternoon. You're listening to the Lindia Grant Show. Here at 1340 WYCB, the oldest gospel radio station in Washington, D.C. It is the first contemporary gospel outlet in the United States of America. Welcome to today's show. We've got a a big show for you today. Uh, My guest will be... The National Federation of Democratic Women. There's a slate of six women running for committee positions on the board from across the country, and they are all here with us today. But first, we're going to have to hear from our own Dr. Julianne Malvo to say hello and to talk politics to us. Uh, before we talk to Dr. Julianne uh, Winston, um, Kevin, can we just say hi to the ladies? Hello, uh, Democratic women. How are you all? Hi. Hey, hi. Great. All right, good. I just wanted to hear everybody's voices. I knew you were there because you told me. But we're going to go to Dr. Julianne Malvo right now. Dr. Julianne, how are you? She is a speaker extraordinaire, as Les Brown can say. Let's hear from <laughs> Dr. Julianne Malvo, the one and only. Well, thank you, Lindy, and first of all, greetings to your guests. Um, Hopefully, y'all, I know y'all have a great segment, so just greetings to you. Uh, this has been an interesting week, as you know, in politics. Today, uh, President Biden was crowing about the unemployment rate. The unemployment rate has dropped. It's 5.8%. This is lower than we've seen it in quite some time, uh, and that's a good thing. The black unemployment rate, however, did not fall. Um, and it always annoys me. When we see an unemployment rate drop, but they don't acknowledge or, or move, and they don't acknowledge the difference in the way that we all experience unemployment. And this is yet another example of that. Uh, brother Biden, I, I, I say that aspirationally. Hopefully he will behave like a brother. Uh, brother Biden um, seems to be at least somewhat conscious of race and racial differences. But this is a this is an opportunity for him really to say more, and he really did it. Uh, he just keeps talking about the historic nature of this. Will it be historic when the black unemployment rate is not higher than the white unemployment rate? That will be historic for you. Uh, but we did this is this is a decent jobs report that uh, was released this morning at eight thirty. Um, there are payroll employment went up by almost what five hundred and fifty five thousand which is a significant, it's, it's, it's near what economists expected. Uh, most of the gains are in leisure and hospitality, in education, in health care, and in social assistance. So th- these are areas that we know have been problematic. But what we haven't seen, frankly, is um, we haven't seen wages go up enough. We have seen productivity go up, but we have not seen wages go up. And people, you keep hearing these people complain that, oh, we can't find any workers. Well, I have advice. If you can't find any workers, pay somebody. If you pay people enough, they will come back to work. Uh, Pay somebody and also deal, you know, the women's unemployment rate uh, dropped a little bit. Uh, But, you know, women are staying home because, many, because they don't have the kind of child care support and assistance that they need. So, um, all this, well, we have, you know, some states are taking back the $300 a week that the feds appropriated. Uh, it's just not time yet. I say take it back in September, but don't take it back now. But in any case, uh, President Biden was really quite thrilled about that. Uh, well, I, I'm glad he has something to be thrilled about. Uh, the, the Senate has not been cooperating at all in the matter of voting rights. In fact, as we know, in Texas, the legislature passed a bill or tried to pass a bill so bad that all the Democrats got got up and left. So they couldn't pass a bill because they didn't have a quorum. Um, they have enough votes to pass if the Democrats would sit there and let it happen. But the Democrats are not inclined to let this happen, not inclined to say, uh, let's take away some voting rights. So 
there is legislation. Uh, Vice President Kamala Harris has now been put in charge of the uh, Voting Act. But um, while there is some legislation, what we need is to get rid of the filibuster. We've taken it to the streets for so many things, Lindia. We've taken it to the streets for voting rights, for the right to vote. We've taken it to the streets for Black Lives Matter. We need to take it to the streets to get rid of that during filibuster. Because we won't have any progress at all unless we get rid of the filibuster. Mitch McConnell has said he wants to oppose anything this president wants. He's treating him just like he treated President Obama. The the filibuster is such an ironic thing because, first of all, a little bitty state like Rhode Island has the same power in the Senate as a big old state like California in and of itself. But now then, with the filibuster... Basically, there, there's no uh, one person, one vote in, in that Senate. There's no p- one person, one vote in our politics. And we need to we need to get rid of the filibuster. I have not said it so emphatically before because I thought something would be worked out. But Joe Manchin doesn't know what he wants to be. Um, they used to call people rhinos. I call him a dino, Democrat in name only. Mm-hmm. I mean, he, he, he is insistent that there be bipartisanship, when I would call, I would tell you what bipartisanship really means if I wasn't on your show. You know, bipartisan, you know what. So in any case, Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, but the filibuster needs to be gone, and we need to be as emotional about that as we've been about anything else because there will be no progress as long as there is a filibuster. Now, finally, we forgot the infrastructure issue, and um, they're inching together, but very, but inching. The president has come down a little bit. The uh, Republicans have gone up a little bit. But the biggest challenge is that they think that infrastructure only means bricks and mortar, that it does not mean people. What you see in the labor market right this minute is connected to the issue of infrastructure regarding child care and elder care. I mean, how many people do you know who won't go back to work because they need child care or their elders need to be mm-hmm. taken care of? And home health workers are paid so little, they're paid $15 an hour to, at most, at most, in some places they're paid even less, to risk their lives. This makes no sense at all, and that's why we're sitting in this situation where we are right now. And if these Republicans could just open their minds up. See, Joe Manchin is from us, one of the poorest states in the country, West Virginia. Those people want, need infrastructure. He's got a raggedy bridge in West Virginia that could go down any day from now. But yet he wants bipartisanship. He needs to want to get that bridge fixed. That's what he really needs to want mm-hmm. to do. So the infrastructure issue stays at the top of the agenda. People are still very interested in it. The president wants it badly. But, you know, Republicans have dug their heels in. Uh, Shelley Moore Capito um, made a proposal, and President Biden said, oh, no, 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 that's not what I have in mind. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. But I will say this, despite the fact that I'm very disappointed regarding uh, the uh, addressing the black unemployment rate, two, three months in, four months in, President Biden is doing a decent job. And we've got to acknowledge that he's doing a decent job. And so we just want to mm-hmm. encourage him to do more better. So that's the policy. All right. <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Julia. We, we appreciate you for being our guest again today. All right. Thank you. We're going to Have go a great on now. All right. We, okay. We're going to go. Thank you. We're going to our commercial break, and we will be back in a moment to talk to the National Federation of Democratic Women. We'll go to our commercial break. Back in a moment. If it wasn't for my if it wasn't for my care coach at Mer Health, I probably wouldn't be so healthy right now. As a man, you know we don't get checkups or see a doctor regularly anyways. It's probably just a man thing because none of my partners go either. We know we should, but we just don't and hope it works out. So what changed for you? A Health assigned me a care coach. Somebody that gives one on one help, answer questions, explain things, and help set my appointments. She also helped me understand what having high blood pressure really means and ways to manage it so it doesn't kill me. It ain't nothing to play with. If you're a member of Merrill, ask for a care coach. I'm glad I got mine. At AmeriHealth, if you need a care coach, you can have one. Just call us at 1-877-759-6224 to get connected. 1-877-759-6224. 
1-800-759-6224. This program is funded in part by the government of the District of Columbia Department of Healthcare Finance, Mayor Muriel Washington Bowser. Washington former religion columnist, Lindia Grant. Who Moved My Cheese is a book about two types of people, those who accept change quickly and move on, and those who hem and haw and try to figure things out. They didn't see change coming and waste valuable time trying to figure out what happened. How did this happen to me? Let's call this group procrastinators. The lesson inside the cheese story is simple. Life is change. Brother said it best when he said, if I accept you as you are, I will make you worse. However, if I treat you as though you are what you're capable of becoming, I help you become that. We must change and keep moving. The Bible tells us to seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be open unto you. Ask and it shall be given. Read more in the religion column of the Washington Informer, an award-winning African-American newspaper. We don't report crime or gossip, just positive news. Pick up the Washington Informer or visit us online at WashingtonInformer.com. Call 202-561-4100 for more information. to the Lindia Grant Show here on Spirit 1340 WYCB. Now we're going to talk to the National Federation of Democratic Women. It is the official organization of the Democratic Party focusing on women's issues. They were established in 1971 as a means of supporting women's voices within the Democratic Party of the United States. The National Federation of Democratic Women hosts national and state-level conferences and activities. This is a recognized constituent group of the Democratic National Committee, DNC, and therefore they have three seats on the DNC, and the president of the National Federation of Democratic Women is part of the executive committee of the DNC. The National Federation has 34 active chapters across the United States. The slate that we're going to be talking to today is running from the floor, and it includes the following members. Carol Comito, she's running for president. Susan Shelton, running for first vice president. Elizabeth Duarte, second vice president. Wendy Carson Smith running for third vice president. Corinne Chase, running for fourth yes. vice president. Candace Ayers, running for recording secretary. I want to just first go to Carol. Carol, are your members currently in leadership positions within the organizations, and why are you running from the floor? Hi, Lindy. First, thank you for inviting us to your uh, radio station here. We're excited to be here. Oh, um, nice so, to meet you, Carol. Nice to meet you, too. So, yes, all all the people that are running on this slate are certainly accomplished women, uh, not only within the National Federation, but also in their own states. So, myself, um, I am currently the first vice president of the organization, and I was previously the fifth vice president, moved up. Susan Shelton is our fourth vice president, moving up to first vice president if elected. Uh, Liz Duarte is currently the regional director for the Eastern Region, and we have four regions, so Liz is in the East. And Wendy is our fifth vice president, running for third vice president. And then last but not least is Candace Ayers, and she's currently the president of the Kansas Federation, and she's running for recording secretary. So you asked why I'm running from the floor. Um, I have been wanting to be a, a part of this organization for quite some time, and I've been working to move to president. Uh, I believe that we can move this organization forward. I want to see it move forward into the 21st century, and I want us to be transparent and open and make sure that everyone is included. So that's the short answer of why I'm running. And Carol, tell us what city and state you're from. 
Uh, right now, I am in Arizona, so um, near okay. Phoenix, Arizona. Yeah. All right. And I was thank you. Uh, I'd like to I'd like to ask each of the ladies if you would share a little bit about yourself and why you're running for office. Uh, can we go to Susan Shelton? Sure. Hello, and again, thank you. I'm currently fourth vice president of NFTW. I'm from Austin, Texas, and so I was actually at the Capitol uh, when your first guest was speaking about the uh, when the Democrats walked out. <laughs> that was one of my side trips. Um, I'm a past president of the Texas Democratic Women, and I started out at NSEW as the recording secretary and moved up to fourth vice president, and I'm running for first vice president. I want to continue the work that we've been doing to get younger women involved in NFDW, and because I think we can do more to demonstrate the power and presence of Democratic women across the nation. Very good. Thank you. Uh, That must have been an exciting evening down in Texas. Okay, we're going to go now to our second vice presidential candidate, Elizabeth Duarte. Elizabeth, the same question to you. Thank you very much for having us. A little bit about yourself Um, and why you're running. Sure, thank you. Sure, and thank you for asking where we're funded from. I didn't put that in my note. I'm from Connecticut, (laughs) and um, Uh currently, as Carol said, um, Eastern Regional Director. Um, for Eastern Region States and Territories. And I'm running for um, second vice president. I uh, feel as though working with this team that's running from the floor, we can make the changes that really need to be made. Um, In the last two years, it's been difficult because um, we just haven't had a majority vote to be able to get some of the new exciting ideas that we have through on a national level. And previously to that, I was corresponding secretary where um, we worked really hard and got far in increasing our communications across the country, which helps to bring everybody together so that we know what everyone else is doing. And I want to be able to get back to that to get um, our communications and social media in um, to the next stage. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, running for third vice president is my friend, Wendy Carson-Smith, who called me to ask me to host this today, and I'd like to thank Wendy for that. I'm always honored to work with Wendy. Uh, she, um, I, I go way back 20-some years working with her husband, Councilman Frank Smith, on the African-American Civil War Memorial, so I'm not trying to give Wendy any extra publicity, but she's my friend, and I have to let you all know that. Wendy, same question to you. Tell us a little bit about you that I didn't always say and why you running for office. Well, thank you, Lindia. I am uh, Wendy Carson Smith. I'm from the District of Columbia. And um, I am running for office because I want us to rebrand NFDW. We do a lot of policy work. We are known for our policy work. We do even more work out in the community, and doing that work in the community, we um, and and being political, we do it through everyone else and not through NFDW. So I want us to talk about and advocate and rebrand to show that we are an action organization. We are the field workers of the Democratic Party. We are the get out. All right. And so I want us to put that out there in the universe, and I want us to be recognized for what we already do. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Wendy. Uh, Next is the fourth vice presidential candidate, Corinne Chase. Uh, Lindy, if she can be with us today. Mm -hmm. She's not going to be here. Okay. Uh, We go to Candace. Can yes, you? thank you, Lindy. I'm so glad to be here. Um, a yes. little bit about me. I'm an online professor at an osteopathic medical college, and I teach statistics and research methods. And as Carol said, I'm currently serving my second term as president of the Kansas Federation of Democratic Women. I'm in the heartland in Topeka, Kansas. 
And I'm running for the NFDW executive board because as I've worked with the women at the national level, I see this organization as having a great deal of potential. But it is at risk of becoming irrelevant due to backward, archaic ways of communicating and recruiting new members and conducting business. And so what I want to do as a member of the board is support the transformation of NFDW that Wendy was talking about so that it is a premier 21st century contemporary women's organization. And that's why I'm running. All right. Very good. Now, my next question is is, um, talking about you your most pressing issues for women. Now, how would you approach these issues if elected? Some of you halfway answer that, but keep your answers short because we only got about five more minutes. So I'm going to go to Carol Comito now from Arizona. Thank you. Well, I think first and foremost is the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment. And then I would say Roe versus Wade. And then there's voting that affects everyone. The Violence Against Women Act, equal pay and equal opportunity for women. And we need more women in our state and federal offices. So the more we can elect, the better uh, we'll be to run this organization. All right, Susan, Shelton, pressing issues for women for you. What, what is your platform? I think that we have a lot of opportunity to sort of drill in and focus on some of the more specific items, like con- the continued fight to expand Medicaid in states. It's something that I think we can really organize and rally around. And for states that have expanded it, I would love it if we could develop some sort of sister network that can organize those members to help train those of us in states like Texas, where we haven't expanded Medicaid, how how they went through the fight, how they can help us expand it more effectively. So I think that's something that we can really bring to the table. All right. Hey, Susan, I'm sorry, Elizabeth, same question. Hi, thank you. Well, the, I agree with everything that has been said. And just to quickly say, um, right now, our, our rights are being stripped away um, fast and furiously, and we need to organize across the nation. We need to communicate with all the states and all the members of Democratic women across the country so that we can put the pressure on um, both individual states and in Washington, D.C., in Congress to make sure that we um, do not go further backwards. Thank you. Wendy, same question. Wendy, are you there? Yes, I am. I said I would. I okay. would. I agree with everything my colleagues have said, but I also would like to focus on voter suppression. We have all of these Republican states that are doing various um, pieces of legislation to suppress the vote, uh, and they're using so many different tactics to keep your head spinning. We need to address that. Okay, very good. And our uh, last one is Candice. Your vision for yeah, women. Yeah. For women. I, I, have to, I have to echo what Carol said, and I, I'm going to go even further and say that probably the most pressing issue we face as women is patriarchy because it is pervasive, insidious, and just as systemic as racism because it affects all areas of our lives from the wages that we earn to the autonomy we have over our physical bodies. And the Equal Rights Amendment is key to reversing that. So if I'm elected, I will be putting my advocacy efforts toward moving Senate joint resolution forward on the Senate floor for a vote. All right. And the last question you all answer in about 10 seconds, something really quick. If you're elected, what is your vision for the in the National Federation? Carol? To make the National Federation the strongest and most well-known women's organization in this country. Thank you. Susan? 
I want to make sure that we develop a pipeline to make this a sustainable organization because we are not going to be doing this forever. We want to make sure that we get a farm team to come in behind us. Elizabeth, same question. What is your vision? I, I want us to be the go-to organization for Democratic women across the country. Wendy, your vision. I want us to be the most diverse women's organization in the country, where we are home for women of color, cult, different cultures, different persuasions, all to come in and work on the democratic issues of our day. And Candace, what is your vision? I would like to see NFDW be as diverse as possible, efficient, ethical, and most of all, technologically forward. All right. Well, thank you to Carol, Susan, Elizabeth, Wendy, uh, and Candace. I think Corinne was absent for joining me today. Your positive, inclusive, and comprehensive vision of the National Federation of Democratic Women is breathtaking, and I wish you well with your candidacies. If you want more information about these ladies running from the floor for the National Federation of Democratic Women, please go to their website. It is www.nfdwforward.com. NFDWforward.com. All right, thank you so much for being my guest today, Democratic National Women. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that concludes our interview for today. Uh, thank you for tuning in to the Lydia Grant Show. Next week, our guest will be Managing Director Mr. Herschel Daniels Jr. of the Brotherhood and Sisterhood International. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Read my column in the Washington Informer newspaper. You are cordially invited to participate in a dynamic worship service at my church, All Nations Baptist Church, at 11.15 a.m. every Sunday morning. Our pastor is the Reverend Dr. James Coleman. Words, thoughts, and deeds have a boomerang effect, so be careful what you send out. Scripture says, my people perish for their lack of knowledge. So think on these things from the Lindia Grant Show. I'm your host, Lindia Grant. Until next week, good day. Thank you for listening to the Lindia Grant Show. Think on these things with your host, Lindia Grant.